morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you in the name of the one about whom Mark Luther has written this morning, Christ Jesus, it is he. You'll remember that he wrote that during isolation. He wrote that when he was isolated, isolating himself from danger. Danger from the church, those who threatened his life. But instead of being a party pooper, feeling sorry for himself, being isolated from friends and family, what did he do? He focused on Christ. Perhaps that's what's needed this morning as well, as we are, in a sense, isolated from one another. But there's someone you're not isolated from. You know who that is? Christ is with us, and he wants even to be more and more the focus of our lives as a result of gathering together. So it's in his name that I welcome you and pray that this will be a time of celebration, of encouragement, and training you for the challenges that you will face the rest of the day as well as the rest of the week. Pray with me. Lord, we're grateful for this global pandemic. We are sorrowful to see people suffer, to see medical personnel taking the brunt of this, being exposed to the challenges of this global pandemic. But we also know that it may, Lord, have a silver lining, and that's to focus on eternity and its values, the things that are truly important, the things that will remain after time has passed away. And that's the eternal truth of Jesus, his redemption, his church, which will last forever. Truly, his example is the example that we want to follow and emulate closely this morning, is to focus in on you and your truth and how that truth can impact our lives and to save others, to redeem others, to encourage others that come into our pathway who might be characterized by hope or by worry and by example anxiety and fear. So equip us through music, through song, through encouragement that we get from one another, and of course through your living and your written word, all to the end that you will smile on us this morning and be glad so that we, when we leave, we will be glad that we met together in the name of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Sisters, brothers, open your mouth and worship our faith. Big thanks to the Benton family and whoever built that little house. I'm not sure who that was, but a big thanks to you too, as well as the whole family. Well done. And, and we need to say thank you to the, uh, I, I hate to be repetitive all the time, but the worship team is on a skeleton crew this morning with some people out sick, etc. But they still are strong and doing their best. Big thanks to each one of you. And then those of you who are parents, you have kids with you today. I know that it's the parent who feels the worst when their kids are running around and just being kids. But we want you to relax, not feel bad. Uh, you know, this is the way it is. And uh, we're glad that the kids could be with you, that you're here. So don't feel bad. We don't. We just expect kids to be kids and to wiggle and God says wiggle. You know, jump and God says jump. So we're good with it. And uh, if, if, if you're okay with it, we're, we're really good with it. We hope you feel accepted and not uh, looked at or uh, judged in any, in any way. Your kids are just kids, so let them be kids. We're glad to have each and every one of them. Yeah, I've got to be careful with this dead squirrel. I have a dead squirrel up here. It's for, um, this is what it's called. Dead cat. Before recurring, a dead cat. Dead squirrel, dead cat. Looks the same to me. They're all dead. Yeah, it doesn't smell too bad. Uh, so yes, uh, thanks for joining with us this morning. I don't see guests, but then again, I have the light, the light shining in my eyes, and I don't have these on this morning, but I will in just a minute. Praise God, the glasses. Well, actually, they're cursed, but uh, you've got to wear them. Necessary evil. But I welcome you, and it's time to look into the Word. I'm excited about it. I hope this will be a blessing and an encouragement, as well as a training session for you, especially those of you who are in relationships with other people, like husbands and wives and parents and kids. There's some things here that I think will be an encouragement to you. So pray with me. Lord, we're blessed to be able to gather together and to celebrate redemption and Christ in praise. And in song, we're grateful for people who are healthy, who have jobs, who are able to be here today, able to lead us. We're grateful for people who are participating. 
Lord, we're just grateful for the good gifts that we have during this time of global pandemic, which all of its issues and fears and anxieties and risks, you have blessed us, and we want to make sure that we say that to one another as well as to you. Now we're going to look at a passage, Lord, in the scripture which is inspired, which has been placed in the Bible, and which really is rather difficult. So we need your help to shine light in the dark areas that are confusing and mysterious. We want the light, Lord, to be able to explain what you're saying so that then we can take it and work it into our lives. We believe, I believe, that this passage, though mysterious and a little bit complex, has much to say to us, much encouragement, and much training and equipping for the life that lies in front of us. So, Lord, in view of that and for your glory, we ask for your guidance this morning. Yes, the influence of your spirit on uh, all who are here. And through social media, perhaps others too can benefit from it. We pray for your glory in Christ's name. I uh, recently visited the optometrist for a new set of these things. I have an unusual set of eyes. One eye is almost perfect. And then the other eye is way far from being perfect. So they, I can't just buy cheaters at the local CVS store. I've got to get something that has a almost normal piece of glass. And on the other lens, something far stronger. And so I had to go get my eyes tested. And uh, the optometrist got me some glasses, some better ones. And then he says, I want you to go to an ophthalmologist. Now that's a doctor who specializes in eyes. And she said, uh, I want you to have your retina opened up and we want to look at your retina a little bit more closely. So uh, I jumped into my Mach 1 and went down to the ophthalmologist and finally got in inside the place and you meet with someone and they take this, all these questions and then it was time for them to uh, dilate my eyes. Have you ever had your eyes dilated? Yeah, it's not a fun experience for me, but so uh, I've had my eyes dilated before, but I have never had my eyes so dilated in all my life by an ophthalmologist. I mean, I could barely see, and uh, they, they looked at my retina and talked about it, and when it was time to drive home, I was in a bad way. Truthfully, I was driving under the influence. I was driving under the influence of drops that they stuck in my eye. So I can truly say, yes, uh, I was a DUI candidate. The problem was I was in my Mach 1. My 71 Mach 1 has enormous torque and power. You just touch the pedal and it's whoosh and it's easy to lose control. It's like riding a stallion that's unbroken. And so I realized this is going to be a challenge to get home safely and not hit my neighbors and the trees and the bushes and the stop signs. So I went as slow as I could. It was almost as if I was just crawling all the way home because my, my, my judgment was blurred. My ability to make things out was, was impaired. It was under the influence of these, whatever that stuff they stick in your eyes. I'm not sure what it was. So I could not make out things when I looked right at it. I was impaired. I was under the influence. This is Jesus' point. Stay with me here. Last week, we expounded a passage that's a great mystery. And this analogy that Jesus is going to give us today from Luke 11, 33 to 36, this analogy about eyes and light explains that passage that we went over last week. And it helps us to understand the next passage that we're going to encounter next week. It's like a ham sandwich. A piece of bread that came before it is the last passage. In the middle is this slice of beef, or ham, or pepperoni. And then the next paragraph further explains, or now that we learn this analogy about the eyes, 
That analogy helps explain this long story about the Pharisees. And that's how Luke always writes. Everything's connected. So if we are look at this passage that we're going to look at this morning, by itself, it would be totally confusing. Let's read, for example. Let's read this passage. And at the end, you might say with me, what in the world is he talking about? It is very confusing. It's an analogy we do not use. Verse 33 of Luke, chapter 11. No one, that's not the way to begin a new thought or a new topic. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a hidden place or under a basket or a bushel, a measuring device. You don't do that. What do you do after you light a lamp? You put it on a lampstand. Why? So that people who come in People who come into the room, or people who come into the house, can see the light. That makes sense. That's, a, that's something we get. Your eye, now here's where the confusion starts. Your eye, notice, not your eyes, it's just singular. Your eye is the lamp that is the source of light that perceives things when you walk down the road. Your eye is a lamp. The lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, when your eye is not diseased, when your eye is not under the influence of drops or a film or cataracts, when your eye is clear and 20-20 vision, your whole body is full of light. Right? What are you talking about? My whole body is full of light if I have a good eye? <laughs> I told you this was going to be confusing. Therefore see to it, verse 35, therefore see to it in view of how powerful and pivotal and impacted a good, clear eye is, a healthy eye with 20-20 vision. In view of that, here's what you should do. See to it. Do you see the pun? <laughs> see to it. That's deliberate on Luke's part. See to it that the light in you is not dark. Huh? <laughs> if then your whole body is full of light with no part in the dark, it will be as full of light as when the light of the lamp shines on you. Like, what are you talking about? Do you have that same impression? Like, Luke, what are you doing with this? This comparison. I don't even understand the comparison, much less why you're using it right here. Let me try to explain this. Now, if I don't explain it clearly and you don't get it, it's my fault. But first, I give myself some credit in that we'll just say, we don't get this analogy because we don't use it. This is a first century analogy. Here's what I think. Here's what I think Jesus is saying and Luke is using. Let me go back to the previous story. You'll remember the previous story we went over last week. Jesus called his generation evil. Remember that? They're evil. They demanded signs, even though Jesus had given them signs. Lots of them. Lots of them. He gave them clear evidence as to who he was. Man, he was doing things that no one else in all of history had done. And yet they were not satisfied. Even though they saw evidence with their eyes, they didn't get it. Their eyesight was impaired. They were under the influence of something that prevented them from looking at Jesus, hearing Jesus, and coming to the conclusion about who his identity was, who he really was. They just said, no, we want more. Then he gives two illustrations. A black woman, the queen of the south, better known as the Queen of Sheba, 1 Kings 10. She heard a report about Solomon's wisdom. That was the only evidence she was given. That's all the evidence she had. And her mind, which is portrayed here as the eye of her body, her mind perceived, saw that the report about Solomon's wisdom was true. And so what did she do? She's from Yemen, modern day Yemen. That's thousands of miles away from Israel. She's African. This 
dude called Solomon is from the Middle East and he's Jewish and he's male. There was so much prejudice that she could have um, banked on to say, oh, I'm not going to pay attention to Solomon. We have our own wisdom here in Yemen. We have our own wisdom in Sheba. After all, I'm a queen. I'm wise. And we've got a whole court full of wise people. So prejudice and bias could have stopped her from inquiring about this report she had heard about Solomon. But instead, what did she do? She heard the report with her mind. Her mind processed it. And she took a two-month journey just to go listen to someone's wisdom. This analogy explains it. This analogy of how our eyes, our faculty of perception, explains why she heard the report, heard the evidence, perceived it correctly, and took a hike. The second illustration is not about a black woman, but a guy named, or the man of Nineveh. Gentiles. They were wicked. Do you know what empire Nineveh was a part of? Do you know your history? They were part of the Assyrian Empire. It, it was the world's greatest superpower at the time and the most cruel and wicked. In fact, they took prisoners of war from battle and they impaled them on posts and stuck them in a row on the gates to their city. Cruel. But when Jonah, a foreigner, showed up and said, in 40 days, God's going to judge you, what happened? They listened to that message and were uninfluenced by prejudice and bias, resentment, and despite the fact that they were wicked and evil, and cruel, they heard that message as evidence of the truth and they all repented from the king all the way down to the lowest person in the culture. They responded to truth. Why? Because their eyes, their minds, their faculty of perception perceived a report or heard a message from Jonah and they responded in faith and repent. It's amazing. When Jonah preached in the city of Nineveh, he had no stage, there was no lights, no entertainment, no smoke, nothing. And what did they do? They repented. This analogy here, this analogy that Jesus is giving here, explains why people who are, even who are evil, can respond to the message of God, respond to evidence that's given to them, and change. And yet, Jesus' own generation, who had a Bible, who had history with God, and saw evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence, they did what? Nothing. Even the Sermon on the Plain, Luke chapter 6, had no results. They saw Jesus, they saw the miracles, they heard him, they saw his life, and what did they do? Nothing. What was their problem? They had an eye problem. They had a mind problem. They heard his message, but they couldn't see the evidence clearly. Why? Because their minds were under the influence of what? Well, if you study the religious leadership of Israel, they had all sorts of issues that clouded their judgment. First of all, we're told in Luke 16 that the Pharisees love money. Greed, greed and materialism blinds us to the truth. Greed and materialism that ever challenged to get rich and to get more and more possessions, that acts as a clouding agent to our minds not able to perceive the truth. Not able to see the evidence for what it is and respond. This is why Paul calls greed twice. Ephesians and Colossians, he calls it idolatry. 
the, the worship of another God. There are many other things that have influenced Jesus' generation. I'll just name a few. Resentment, bitterness, anger, bias, prejudice, racism, all of those things blinded their eyes from seeing the evidence of who Jesus was. So what he does in verse 36, excuse me, 35, but he says, therefore, in view of the power of our eyes to perceive things clearly, in view of that, here's what you should do. That the light in you is not darkness. What does that mean? He's saying work on your eyes. Go to the eye doctor. But in practical terms, it would be work on your mind because your mind is the faculty of perception just like your eyes are a faculty of perception. Let's illustrate it this way. If you have bad eyes, like I did on the way home from the ophthalmologist, and I had a really bad case of blindness in my eyes, I would look at something like a stop sign and I may read, speed up. I may look at a yield sign and be confused. I may look at a tree and it look like a person. I may look at a red light and I might think, that's green, time to go through the intersection. You see, so our, our, our eyes are faculties of perception. Our mind and our eyes work together to send signals to us, to, to respond. But Jesus is telling us that when our minds are saddled, even as Christians, when our minds are saddled with things that are, make our heart unhealthy, like anger, a, 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 a propensity to be always angry and resentful and jealous and bitter, these things blind us to ourselves and they blind us to the evidence that God brings to us. I see this when I teach and people hear things they've never heard before from the Bible. They've been raised in a traditional way about how to understand these particular passages. And when I show them the truth of the passage, when I show them the truth of what the original text is saying, they refuse to believe it. Why? Because they're biased by prejudice, by assuming that whatever they learned when they were 6 or 16, that's got to be the right way. They, they can't embrace the truth of the Scripture. I found when I was going through education that the things that I thought were true, they're not. I had to unlearn so much of what I was raised with as a missionary kid. I had to almost completely change what I believed in so many different areas when I saw the truth. But I had a choice. No. Those people who taught me, they must know what they were talking about. After all, they love God. But yes, they love God. But they were so misled. <laughs> they were so misled by tradition and by their own teachers. I read a book when I was in grade two. I still have the book. About a missionary in Africa. I won't tell you his name, but he's well known in, in Christian circles. And I read that little book, and it was, it was meant for elementary school kids. Um, and this, this missionary to Africa was portrayed as a great man, a great person. Well, about 20 years ago, I read the original book from which that little book was based, or upon which that little book was based. I read a book by an author who lived in the time of this great missionary to Africa. You know what? <laughs> I got a whole different story whole different perspective. This guy was not worthy to be a hero. I saw the way he treated his wife. And I saw the way he treated his kids. And I thought, I don't care what kind of a missionary you were. I don't care how famous you were and what you did. See, it, new information, truthful information based on solid evidence forced me to change my mind. I could have said, well, I'm going to go with what I learned when I was young. After all, that's the truth. That would have been prejudicial and biased. So I changed my mind. I have a different perspective 
of this particular missionary. I have bigger perspective. Jesus wants us, therefore, to, in response to the danger of minds that are biased by anger, by resentment, by prejudice, he wants us to cultivate a mind, to cultivate a mind that's honest and that faces new truth and embraces it and believes it, rather than being stuck in old traditional ways. So, if I think about how this message might be implemented in our lives, even though this is really not part of my outline, I'm going to lead off. This is the lead off hitter for my takeaway. If you, you live with someone like a spouse, kids, you work with people, and you are the cause of problems, you're the cause of division, you're the cause of arguments, you're the cause of disagreements that turn hostile, and you are one who refuses to listen to the truth of God's Word, even when it necessitates you changing the way you think about passages and thinking about God, if you find yourself in that position, Jesus would say, perhaps you need to sit down with your spouse or with someone that you trust and has your interests in mind, your welfare in mind. They love you. They want the best for you. They want you to grow. That you would sit down with them and you would ask them this question with full permission. What am I really like? What's it like for you to live with me? What's it like to have me around? And if the answer is given, you know what? You're always lying. You're always fitting. You're always shading the truth. You're always prejudicial and biased and angry and resentful and proud and arrogant. If that person says those things to you and knows that they have permission to speak the truth without retribution, you know what can happen? You can either say, I reject that, or believe it, embrace it, and begin a journey in your heart and in your mind to let Christ remove those things and replace them with humility and patience and an open mind and open heart. It'll make such a difference in your relationship for the rest of your life. Now this is a pivotal moment, I think, for perhaps many here. A pivotal moment in your marriage. Often marriages get in a ditch, and they just stay in that ditch for 30 and 40 and 50 years. Why? Because they don't understand or accept this I, faculty of perception, mind, faculty of perception, how important that is, and how it determines life how it determines relationships. Coming to grips with the people that we are, seeing the evidence of who we are, seeing the evidence of what I'd like to live with is so pivotal. If you were to say, you know what, you're right, I am that way. I do lie, I do fail, I do cause arguments. I always have to have the last opinion based on what? Pride and arrogance. You know, if you were to embrace that, embrace the truth, because your eye perceives it correctly, and then you're willing to undergo some change and some steps, that moment could be so pivotal to your marriage, to your whole life. What a difference it would make. And you'd never have to really do that again. It would be awkward. Yeah, it would be hard. Yeah! <laughs> the pride never likes to be poked, does it? Pride never likes to be poked or punched <laughs> or pinched. But the change in the relationship would be so incredible. Yeah, yeah. This is why Jesus 
calls his generation what? Evil. They had evidence and they didn't want it. Why? Because they were blinded by prejudice. Blinded by bias. They couldn't see evidence when it came up and slapped them in the face. They couldn't. They were under the influence. Like I was under the influence driving. People are under the influence of tradition, cultural mores, racism. These things prevent you from understanding the Bible. Prevent you from understanding additional truth that may help you in your life. As Christians, therefore, if you are honest about who you are and you've acknowledged it, the evidence obviously pretty clear, then for the rest of our lives, the rest of your life, my life, we want to cultivate an open heart, an honest heart that faces the truth that God gives us about himself and the scriptures is about ourselves and move accordingly based on that. This is why some people who hear the truth reject it and why others accept it. It's the condition of their mind. Yeah. Now, this is acknowledge, or I acknowledge this is a difficult passage to comprehend and also to accept. But there's hope here. If Jesus says, make sure to do this, that's hope. That means that you don't have to stay this way if you're that way. It means we can change. God will give us enabling grace to change. I hope that for everyone here. The future of your relationships and the future of your marriages. I just want to see everyone enjoying that intimacy and love and happiness in their relationships. Everyone wants that. But this is the reason why so many don't. And it's why Jesus looked at his generation and said, you're evil. And yet people like Nineveh Queen of Sheba were able to hear the truth, just a tiny bit of it, and embrace it and respond. Richard LaPointe is a man who just died recently due to complications with COVID-19. He had a syndrome called Danny Walker syndrome. It affects your mental and physical body. And someone killed his mother-in-law and he was arrested for it and when he was arrested for it he trusted his questioners for nine and a half straight hours they interrogated him and he trusted them and thought they were good guys and he gave them three different confessions of I'm guilty but all three confessions totally contradicted themselves and they contradicted the facts of the crime and his interrogators knew that he was innocent. But because they had a confession in hand, they pressed for conviction, put him to court, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, even though he was totally innocent. What did they do? They suppressed the evidence that he had Dandy Walker syndrome and that therefore his statements could not be trusted. They suppressed it. Why? Because they were biased and prejudiced and angry and unjust. And so they suppressed the evidence that was clear to them. After 26 years in prison, a group called Centurion, a group of attorneys, lawyers, who see cases that have been flagged as problematic, took his case underway, investigated it, investigated the nine and a half hours questioning and realized this man has served 26 years in prison for a crime he never committed. And the court overturned his conviction, declared him innocent. And when he got out, he found that his wife was long gone, remarried, and his son had disappeared. And he spent the rest of his days in a nursing home, suffering, alone, and then contracted COVID-19 and died just a couple of months ago. You don't know him, but I don't know him, but what he does is illustrate, his case illustrates what? The power 
the deteriorating power of bias and prejudice when faced with evidence. And instead of letting the evidence speak for itself, they suppressed it, and a man suffered. That's what Jesus wants to avoid. He wants us to avoid suppressing the truth that God shows us in the Bible about Jesus, about redemption, about a lot of things, and also to suppress the truth about ourselves. Well, we'll, we'll, learn, we'll, we'll learn more about that next week when he encounters the religious leaders of Israel called Pharisees. They saw the truth, and they rejected it. Why? Because their hearts were packed with prejudice and bias and materialism. Thank you for listening to this morning. God, give us grace to face the truth. Let's see. Jesus, uh, sometimes your words are hard to understand. Sometimes they're hard to accept, but they're truth. And if there's someone here, Lord, who has heard the truth and knows that it is you who are speaking to them and are pleading with them because of your love for them and your desire to see some substantial change, let today be a blessing for them. Give them enabling grace to accept it, to converse maybe with a spouse, to converse with family, to converse with people who have to live with that person. And let the conversation be open, frank, humble, merciful, and successful. So that truths that have been rejected might be seen, embraced, and accepted. Truth about Jesus, truth about the scripture, truth about themselves. Lord, we want to see people, men, women, boys and girls, in harmony and at peace with you and one another for the rest of their lives. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Then let's go home with a blessing. You'll see it that it's placed on the screen visibly for you, I take it, and there's a place for you. It's called All. There's a place for me, leader, and we ask you to join with us. Kids, dads, moms, old, young, male, female, people from the Yemen, people from Nineveh, man, you're welcome. Join me. And now to him who is able to protect us from stumbling. And to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blame us and for great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Let us go forth in confidence. Thanks be to God. Amen. You are dismissed.